Uh, namaskara, good evening, and welcome to BIC Streams. Bangalore International Center, or BIC, is an inclusive and neutral platform for conversations, intellectual dialogues, exchange of ideas, and the arts. Today's BIC stream session is the art of inclusive living, taking visual art to the visually impaired. To commemorate World Sight Day, in today's session, we will have a presentation by Siddhant Shah, the founder of Access for All, a global EDI consultancy that aims at creating inclusive experiences for all in the domain of arts, heritage, corporate, and educational spaces. He will talk about the current situation of exhibition spaces, highlighting the apathy and insensitivity towards persons with disabilities and the new approaches that are being legislated by both governmental and public sensitivities. This is the foundation for his work in making museums, corporate and educational spaces more inclusive and accessible. Following his presentation, he will engage in a conversation with Prima John, the director of the Indian Music Experience, who will be speaking about IME's work in the area of accessibility and inclusion with a focus on cognitive, auditory and visual impairment. This program is in collaboration with the Ganesh Shruf Swami Foundation Ganesh is here with us. And before I hand it over to Ganesh, uh, just a reminder for the audience that the full bios of the speakers will appear in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions for the panelists, please drop them in the Q&A box and uh, the speakers will address them at the end of this session. Also for our uh, diverse audiences today, uh, all of us would be giving a visual description of where we're located and what uh, we're wearing. So my name is Neha and I am wearing a white kurta, black earrings, and I have, uh, I'm sitting in a library, so there are bookshelves uh, behind me in the background. And now I hand it over to Ganesh. Thank you, Namaskara and good evening. Um, my name is Ganesh Shivaswamy and thank you for that introduction from the Bangalore International Center. Following the protocol of uh, reaching out to those with visual needs. Uh, I am also seated with a stack of uh, books behind me, law books, and I am wearing a black kurta. And um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome. Uh, this talk, uh, I would like to dedicate to the memory of Dr. R.M. Varma, a reputed neurosurgeon. This year is his centennial anniversary. Ladies and gentlemen, life is a sensory experience and civilization is a creature of evolution. And what do we do for a person who has visual need, uh, who has sensory needs or sen sensory deprivement? A uh, society and a civilization has to reach out in order to ensure that their life, that we include them and make them part of our lives. This evening, we uh, talk about uh, various visual uh, various diversities or various needs uh, we are going to talk about uh, visual uh, visual supplementation we're talking about auditory we're also talking about cognitive the need was uh, uh, recognized legislatively as early as in 1995 with the enactment of the persons with disabilities equal opportunities act uh, which later came to become the rights with, of persons with disabilities act in uh, 2016. It's no longer an option for us. It is now really a legal imperative. So talking this evening are two speakers. One is Siddhant Shah of Access for All. He will be taking us through uh, largely uh, visual needs. We are also joined with uh, by Prima John. She's the director of the Indian Music Experience Museum. And both of them, ladies and gentlemen, will talk about inclusive living. So let us begin with Siddhant Shah, and thereafter it continues with Prima John. At the end, we come back to look into the Q&A box, uh, box. So ladies and gentlemen, leave your queries in the Q&A box. And with that, Siddhant, you're on. Thank you. Thanks, Ganesh. Uh, I hope I am audible. And following the track of giving a visual description, this is an element that was introduced while we all moved into a digital space during COVID. And as part of that, it is mandated to give a visual perception about who the person is. Like, so I would just talk about that 
I, you can see the half of my body. You can see my face. I'm wearing a pair of black glasses and I have wired earphones attached and my background is blur. Continuing with that, I will share my presentation and basis which I would be talking about various elements of inclusion and access that we cater to, particularly in the domain of visual arts, making them accessible to a audience with visual impairment. This, the way I would appreciate for you all to look at the presentation would be that do take them as key notes or like even just like takeaways of what all can you do? Because what I've tried to do is put examples and give like takeaways of like easy ways of making sure that accessibility is possible. Largely, when we do this, a lot of times questions of budget, various questions about how do we start that comes around. And we can discuss that in the, in the Q&A, but largely the presentation gives you like simple, easy ways of really getting started and making sure that even if you change certain elements into your space, into your digital interface or any element that you're bringing in, it can be made more inclusive and accessible. And second point that I would like to consider is that accessibility is an incremental process. It does not start uh, like with one, uh, uh, one stroke and end over there. Like it is something that you keep on doing, you keep on growing because needs keep on changing and you keep on adapting to it. So with that, I start my presentation. Uh, in case if there's any change that is required, just let me know and I'd be happy to go accordingly. So the whole reason of doing this today is because today is World Sight Day. And on this day, there are various different events that take place and that look at elements of awareness around the importance of sight, what are the features and things that are catered to for those with visual impairment and other needs and assistive uh, development that is there in the domain of the sight-based world. But taking this opportunity, we would be looking at various elements of accessibility and inclusion. And through that, through our work at Access for All and other elements that we have catered to. So Access for All started as an organization that aims at pushing the boundaries of physical, intellectual, and social access needs with bridging the gap between disability and arts, culture, and heritage. And we aim at providing an inclusive and integrated approach. The ideas and the services that we offered range from various elements to looking at access audits, Given the RPWD Act that Ganesh mentioned, which is Rights for Persons with Disability Act of 2016, there are certain compliances that have been adhered to and are required in built spaces and other public spaces like exhibitions, museums, art galleries, that, or even corporate spaces for that matter, that they need to be compliant to those needs. And with those elements, we also look at what are the facilities that we could provide in the digital space and making the websites more inclusive and accessible. Braille and tactile signage has been something that we have been constantly doing. Uh, sign language interpretation as, as a service increased tremendously when we all shifted to the screen-based interaction for the two years of COVID and even for any other interaction that we have. Uh, we work with inclusive in outreach programs, so with with the India Music Experience, uh, the museum, we have done their accessibility audit. We are, we are auditing their outreach programs and seeing how can they open up the brackets of including more and more diverse audiences within the space and also making the spaces physically accessible. We particularly look at developing programs and inter, uh, special needs educational programs, integrating them with culture for the groups with autism disability sensitization and awareness programs, looking at training in the domain of inclusive communication, marketing and HR, so that diversity of representation increases and creating audio books and descriptions, given the fact that that also is another way to experience visual arts for those with visual impairment and eventually also looking at CSR management plans. So the aim is to be one point destination for any accessibility needs for any requirement. And I think the most important element is that how do you start and the step zero for any domain, any work for 
access needs is where you kind of start recognizing the disability and the best example of that is the rpwd act the right for persons with disability act 2016 kind of gives a clear understanding of this where there is a representation of 21 disability the number increased from 7 to 21 where they have been identified and one also sees things like uh, elements of acid attack victims that have been added to this list also looking at as you read through the list you would see that of course there are certain disabilities that are covered even diseases have been covered into this the reason being that these conditions or diseases also require certain facilitation for the individuals and hence they are categorized over here so that the needs their additional needs could be adhered to so one of the most important thing is to recognize them and then work around with that the first thing that we do is that we start looking at accessibility and we make things accessible as per the needs and the requirements so this what you see is our classic work that we keep, we do we work with various different arts based organizations museums art galleries to make their visual collection more inclusive and accessible for a wider group of audiences we as you can see the artwork is available in a tactile format it is very different from what you would typically see in a museum where there would be a please do not touch sign our sign says please touch and explore and likewise how you would have a caption next to an artwork even they have braille captions for people to read and understand them taking from here we have grown over a period of time and we've tried to look at different things that you could do and one of the most important thing is also to have an appropriate size and space for approach and use the reason why i mention appropriate size and i would like to share this experience we do not have a textbook or we did not have something that was a ready reckoner for us when we started. And at India Art Fair, when I did the tactile artworks for the first time, we made them in size of eight by eight inches. And while everybody found that interesting, one of the persons who was experiencing this, she came and she very politely asked me that, do all artists make the artworks in the same size? Because all the tactile artworks were in the same dimension. And that really made me understand and gave us the idea that we had to make sure that at least we stick to the size of the artwork or we kind of keep the scale similar or any intervention that you would provide needs to adhere to the context of it. It really needs to be with the context. And the second image shows that sometimes we do not only provide the, the facility in one space, but we keep it mobile to cater to the needs that if we have tactile artworks, which can be handed over to them, they can go around touching them, they can go around experiencing things. And even we can take these artworks to other places. So accessibility is also not only about bringing them to your space, but taking your facilities, your services to them so that they also can experience those elements without physically coming to the site. While we, we would be creating the tactile experience, one feedback that we would constantly get is that, but this is interesting when you're talking about flowers and you're talking about these elements, can we smell them? And we also then over a period of time make, started making them multi-sensorial. So this is one of the artworks by Lakshman Pai that we did for DAG. And, it had the, the gajra in the, the garland in the hair, had a certain uh, flower and the flower has a very peculiar fragrance, which you find available extensively in the Fisher uh, women community. You've, you see them wearing that for the need and we kind of brought that fragrance into the artwork so that when they were touching it, they could also have a smell along with it. So we try to integrate the experience rather than segregating the experience. And over a period of time, we've been, we started doing that. And the need came for the information that while we would give the information physically taking them around, there were also times when we were not available. And that was the time we realized that along with this, there needs to be Braille catalog. There needs to be Braille books, guidebooks that would give them an understanding. It would make it easier for them. And more than anything, it would make them feel independent in the space. And I think that is one of the most important thing when you're considering accessibility is that the, the dignity that the person should feel while they're in the space needs to be catered to. And 
along with that, we started integrating information. So we started bringing Braille into the tactile, or we started creating 3D products. We started doing 3D printing for various different information that was available. And we started making it more approachable. We started making it more available to people in different formats and creating kits that could go for them. And this is what we have recently done. We started looking at how to integrate information because prior to this, you see the text and Braille separately, but we have designed and we've developed this new material, which is transparent Braille that can be laid over a written text and hence it becomes way more integrated. And along with that, there are two things that you can take away with this is that if you're making any information accessible for anyone with visual impairment, again, visual impairment is an umbrella term like low vision, partial sight, they all fall under that. And you can consider using a source serif text or a font when you're putting your content on a poster or any other medium and try using contrasting color because it helps uh, the visual impact for, of the object. When you're putting up any video content or like when we do any, any digital content, our videos are subtitled. We have a sign language insert in that. So this is our sign language video that we're doing for a program for the British Council, which is on developing a manifesto for an accessible arts festival. We make sure that all elements are catered to and the frame is also tight enough for them to observe the hands while they are signing it. And along with that, like the simplest thing that you can do is even if though you're not able to have an insert of sign language, you can definitely just have subtitles. And these are simpler ways in which you can make content more inclusive and accessible. Uh, when we now look at the site, somebody was asked uh, when we would approach museums, they would ask us that, but this seems to be an extremely expensive business, you know, of making the entire space more accessible. Again, coming back to the idea that we can start doing things incrementally. You can start working around things in a way that this is something that works for everyone. Like it works for an audience who, who has uh, a neurodiverse background or there are visual uh, those who have impaired vision or even for those who are of, of a certain age like age also is a is an important factor to consider using these visual markers if you have a space your offices you can really in, in use them so that it becomes easier for people to navigate and look and identify level differences and this is a simple thing by just using the tape you can see there are two types of tapes over here there is one that is a color indicator, which is a visual indicator, and the other one is a tactile indicator. And nowadays you also get the integrated tape where the yellow black one has a tactile element to it. So you may not necessarily have to put two tapes together. And these are very simple things, but they kind of help in the intuitive movement and mobility of persons with visual impairment and other needs within the space. This is a picture that I always, prefer using because I have realized that this is something that talks about our current understanding of just the mindset of why we use and put down things or, you know, the awareness that we have towards accessibility. When we were doing this, we had given very clear instructions to our contractor that we would require, uh, we needed a step ramp and a step ramp typically is a ramp that starts has a landing and then it again continues. I'm drawing over here to give you an idea that this is what a step tramp would mean. And step tramp allows easy access for a person when they're moving up the ramp, which is slightly steeper. And while they were reviewing it and when we said that we'll come for a review and we would just like to see the work that you've done, overnight they broke the front part of the ramp and they added a step because we had told them a step tramp. And it just goes to think and show that us that, you know, this is a level of awareness that we have. And it becomes extremely important to have logical reasoning. A ramp or any element of accessibility is catered to so that you lower the physical effort of the function that you're going to cater to. And if one knew that this would, I could have used a picture of the other ramps that we've created, but I just put this to show you that next time when you go around, when you see any public space or any other spaces where there are ramps, see if they cater to the gradient of it or, or if it is of a certain slope height so that a ramp can, a wheelchair can go up easily. 
And with COVID, what happened was that suddenly our spaces changed, like the concept of a public space changed. And we, while we were also working with the, with the IME, the Indian Music Experience, we saw that the museum also had some interesting ways in which they were catering to the audiences that was available online. Of course, you have an audience that is available in the space, but you also have a new audience now that is out there because they could not physically come to your space. And hence, the digital inclusion became an important element. And I think these are key seven principles of digital inclusion that one must definitely consider. We start with the keyboard accessibility. The keyboard accessibility means that you should be able to navigate your website only using the tab key or the arrow keys on your, on your keyboard. The use of color, as I have mentioned previously, the importance of contrasting colors that one needs to cater to. The fonts need to be very clear. They need to be source serif ideally so that they are easily read. And also using font and not using an, an image of the written text because somebody who would prefer using a screen reader software for them that written content if it is used as fonts will read out to them as a text it will read out loud to them but otherwise if it's an image like say for example the content that i've put up over here the new public space digital inclusion if that was an image my screen reader would only read that element as an image and not read the, the content that was mentioned in there. So please make sure that you have those elements over there. Website navigation becomes extremely important. Like, is it going with the flow of like how I would like to prefer like intuitively scroll a website or it has a, a movement which is right and left. And it's a choice that one makes. It is depending on who are you catering to, which audiences you're looking at. These are things that you would do. And you can see there are simpler plugins also that are available and Prima would be talking about that. A simpler plugin of UserWay or any other element that makes your website more inclusive and accessible. Content and structure largely comes from what you're putting in, the words that you would be using. As you can see, my presentation had very simpler words. There were words that were very limited and it was something that was lucid enough for one to understand what it would mean. And that is what comes through when your content structuring is done. How do you also let the flow of event, uh, the flow of information come through becomes important. And lastly, looking at images and media. While we when we come to the Q&A part, I would be talking about one simple way in which you can make your images accessible on your social media is through the concept of alternate text that is now easily available on, on Facebook, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, because when you drop an image on that, it will automatically ask you for an alt text and alt text is a visual description of that image, which one can utilize and use in the space. So on that note, I would like to end my presentation and keeping time in mind. These were the things that I thought, like, feel free to take a screenshot of this or we will request also BIC to send it across to all of you all who've registered for the event that there are simpler ways in which you can make your content, your information, things that you are doing inclusive and accessible. And this works across, like, if you are running a practice which, or if you are a doctor, if you are a lawyer, if you are an educator, simpler things into your day-to-day -day life and changes would make your information, your space more accessible. And just going back through the list is about the first and the most important thing is recognizing diversity and not only recognizing diversity outside, but also hiring people with various needs into your organization because they will be your ambassadors to tell you about how to bring about a change in the space creating accessible spaces and requirements creating things accessible as per the needs of those audiences integrating information as you saw like how we brought in braille and text together within the space through the the transparent braille that we're doing uh, simpler things like using a source serif font color contrast simple level indicators for making your spaces more negotiable and uh, mobile for groups with various different uh, abilities. 
using elements that would have appropriate size and space requirements and lastly looking at digital inclusion and we would be more than happy to send or share any information if you need and our details are available over there so on that note thank you so much and if you have any queries we will be happy to take them during the q and a session and based on these services i've just put this in a visual format because this is what we've kind of done at ime also we started looking at the built spaces we were looking through an accessibility audit of the physical space that they have then also looking at their outreach programs and how inclusive they can be made and because they already had certain things providing for sign language interpretation facilities for other requirements and also likewise conducting disability sensitization workshops for the organization so that the team is also aware of the needs and as an organization when somebody is taking this decision it is important to bring all stakeholders including the staff that is manning the door versus somebody who is taking curatorial decisions and lastly looking at the website accessibility services for all other diverse needs of the group so on that note thank you so much and i open the space for prima john to talk to us about the work that they have been doing thank you so much uh, siddhant for that fantastic presentation uh, just to describe what my screen or i look like right now i'm wearing a white shirt with a collar uh, i have mid length black hair i'm wearing brown glasses i'm also brown skinned and there are little leaves that are popping out from one side of the screen uh, it's a monstera plant so it has slightly larger leaves uh that's what i look like right now i i'm very excited and happy to be here with all of you and to present some of the work that ime has been doing so uh what siddhant was talking about was more from uh an organization that is dedicated to looking at accessibility with different institutions i'm going to be speaking from the perspective of one such institution and delving a little bit deeper into what are some of the things that we have been doing and have been able to do over the last uh, one or two years and like uh, siddhant said it's an incremental process so for us this is just the beginning uh, i also just want to thank uh, bangalore international center and also ganesh for inviting me on this panel uh, to give you a sense of the work that we do ime from the very beginning has been committed to a more inclusive and uh, diverse perspective not just through physical accessibility and infrastructure but also through our outreach and programming initiatives which is what i will talk about uh, in a little bit more detail for those of you who don't know ime we are an interactive uh, digital experience based museum located in bangalore we are relatively young we opened fully to the public only in late 2019 and we all know what happened in 2020 so it hasn't been that long that we have been uh, open but we have always focused on being more inclusive we are extremely proud of being one of the few museums actually and cultural institutions in india that is fully accessible by wheelchair right from the parking to all levels of the museum including all gallery spaces we see physical accessibility just as a first step it's through our programming reviews and continued initiatives that we can address some issues of psychological inclusion as well um if you see the uh image here this is a render the project actually has been in development for about 10 years now uh it is india's first interactive music museum and the only institution of its kind that's dedicated to documenting the history of music in india we are located in jp nagar and are supported by the brigade group the vision of ime primarily is to introduce audiences to the diversity of indian music and also to build a strong community and when we talk about community it is not just some sections of society it's all sections of society which is why accessibility diversity and inclusion has become such a strong focus for us the museum comprises of high tech multimedia uh, exhibit galleries it also has a sound garden there's also a learning center where you can learn music and we also have several performance spaces since opening in 2019 we've had about uh, 1 lakh visitors come in um in the past few months we've had a regular inflow of about 
thousand to fifteen uh, fifteen hundred visitors coming in every week, and uh, many more that we have reached out to and accessed online as well. Uh, this is the uh, main entrance of the museum. And here you will see that uh, I have marked some spaces where we have worked on uh, physical accessibility, which is the railing which is installed here. There's also the accessibility ramp, which uh, Sidan showed you an example of uh, at the right corner. And on the left hand side, we have the sound garden, which is a project that was designed by an Oroville based organization called Swaram. It's actually one of the most popular parts of the museum where uh, people, there are 10 instruments and uh, they are made with different materials like wood, uh, metal, uh, and other natural and uh, inorganic materials. And people are invited to come play with it. So all uh, younger people, older people, everybody loves the uh, sound garden. I'm just giving you a sense of what the uh, institution is so you know what space we are talking about. This is uh, the entrance to uh, the main galleries, which is on the third floor. Here we see a set of panels depicting Bharata's Navarasas. The Navarasas or nine moods uh, form the basis of expression of uh, Indian ragas and uh, the Indian music system. And uh, we use the idea of uh, moods also uh, in terms of accessibility and especially when talking to younger audiences uh, to show how our moods can be related to music and how different types of music and sound can have an effect on how we feel and think. So we start the entire uh, exhibition and all the galleries with the Navarasas. This is a uh, immersive uh, installation that we have, which is the introductory film. It's called Nadam. It's a 10 minute immersive film, which talks about the origins of sound and music coming from nature. This next installation is called the Samai Chakra. This is also an immersive installation uh, with this large disc, which has a video projection and sound projection. It talks about the classification of different ragas based on the time of day or season. The Hindusani tradition, as I'm sure all of you know, uh, time prescription arises from an understanding of how sunlight and climate factors govern people's lives and moods. So as carriers of emotional values, ragas are believed to be more effective at certain times of the day or during the night or even certain seasons. So this is the Samay Chakra installation, which kids especially love. So we have these little stools that we have put in the space so people can sit and look up. But when different groups come, we actually remove these little stools and we uh, have people lie down. This is an entirely carpeted area. And they lie down and they have a fully immersive experience of the projection, which is overhead. This is another important gallery for us, which is called the Songs of Struggle Gallery. As you can see, it is built uh, almost like a library or an archive, and it explores music from political movements, um, specifically the national movement, of course, but also songs of protest and dissent that have emerged in, uh, in, at different points in India's history. This is one of, again, the most popular galleries at the museum. It's the Instruments Gallery, and it is an entire vertical wall which has a display of about 100 instruments, uh, string instruments, wind instruments, uh, and also percussion-based instruments. And what is peculiar about uh, this gallery and also all the other instruments that you see at IME is that apart from basic maintenance, and upkeep that we do for the instruments, we also get them tuned. So a professional musician comes in and all of the instruments at IME are periodically tuned as well. So this was some of the galleries. Now I'll come to talking about uh, some of our accessibility initiatives. It was in 2021. So this is one year after the pandemic and uh, we, I think, all realized how important it is to be more open to the communities around us and to include, uh, you know, when the idea of public, I think, also changed considerably uh, in that time period for all of us. And it was in 21 that we spearheaded an initiative to become a more inclusive, very focusedly a more inclusive public museum and uh, uh, giving the ability to have the diverse experiences as you saw from the galleries that we have 
curated, organized, and designed to be more accessible to everyone and not just uh, some people. To do this work, we invited field experts in the areas of architecture, research, psychology, and also music therapy to study and develop programs for uh, diverse groups and specifically groups with neurodivergent needs. The uh, aim of the project, so when we wanted to get into accessibility, instead of uh, just looking at uh, physical audits and infrastructural changes we could make, we also wanted to look at programming. But instead of uh, getting directly into programming, we took the step to do uh, a considerable amount of research and development with field experts and then get into the implementation process. So the two-pronged approach was uh, research for the programming, and the other one was accessibility audit, which we did with uh, Siddhant and his team at Accessibility uh, Access for All. And based on the research uh, and accessibility audits, we came up with uh, two set of recommendations. One was immediate because we wanted to start programming and we wanted to develop initiatives where we invite different communities. So we knew there were some absolutely immediate and urgent changes that we needed to make, uh, certain um, policies that we needed to put in place, not just in terms of infrastructure, but also in terms of training of staff uh, and preparedness for inviting this community into our space. This is where Project Swarita was born. Uh, the project is called Project Swarita. It was initiated uh, in 2021 with the research project. And it's organized in collaboration with the Kotak Mahindra Foundation and consulting partners Ririti and Swarakshima Foundation, who are our uh, outreach uh, and knowledge partners. Uh, Swarita is an outreach initiative of the museum, and it helps us become a more uh, democratic, inclusive, and accessible space. As part of the project, we opened our doors to children and adults from neurodivergent backgrounds. And when I say neurodivergent backgrounds, what I mean is uh, people who have diagnosed intellectual disabilities or who suffer from, uh, uh, who have ADHD or are on the autism spectrum or related uh, um, diagnosis. Uh, as part of the project, we opened our doors to children and adults from these backgrounds. Uh, and this wasn't, normally in museums you would see, okay, they come for a tour, they do a small activity and they go. But our project is such that it is a comprehensive multi-visit program. And in fact, we work with the same groups uh, over different calendar years. So we work with them 21, 22. We're hoping to work with some of the same communities and people over 22, 23. Um, we also uh, include families and especially caregivers, which are a key part of uh, our contact and our association with the beneficiaries. We work with them. We uh, also train them so that the uh, impact from the project does not remain in the uh, within the time frame of the duration of the workshop or the event, but it goes past that and back to their homes. So these are some of the, our aims and objectives and parameters that we looked at. I'm going to delve a little bit deep into tell you uh, how we conducted the research and how we uh, looked at the different aspects of this project, especially from an institutional perspective, because when we get down to uh, wanting to do something like this in our own spaces, and this is knowledge that we're hoping to share with different organizations across India, This um, because we've had the uh, ability to do this research and we're, uh, we're really wanting to share it so that all museums and all spaces become more inclusive. So the first aspect of it was looking at a barrier-free environment, which is the physical uh, accessibility audit that we had done with uh, Siddhant and team. The second aspect of it was the experiential part of it, which was the immersive tour development, which we needed to focus on and uh, understand from the point of view of neurodivergent communities. And the last was developing a workshop or an actual engagement. So there was physical uh, accessibility, there was the immersive tour experience, and a music therapy or an engagement workshop. And in each of these areas, we looked at a research phase, we looked at the implementation phase and the outcome phase. 
Now, if I go into a little bit more detail about the accessibility audit, for example, that we did with Siddhant and team, this was done in September 2021, which is only um, just about uh, over a year from uh, now, year back from now. And uh, these are the various aspects that we looked at in that accessibility audit. It's a very detailed report. There are several aspects that we look at, uh, not just... Um, you know, physical access, but very, very specifically where we can put hazard signs, uh, signages that we can work on, braille for elevators, ramps. There are so many, many recommendations that we continue to use this, um, this report and this series of reports actually as a basis to become more and more inclusive. So the physical uh, accessibility audit we did in September 2021. These are some uh, parameters that we looked at. So you can see, uh, you know, the mm, the visit and the study was actually conducted using a wheelchair. And some areas where there's still room for improvement, where exhibits are not as accessible. Some of the immediate changes that we made to start the Project Swarita program was uh, brain enabled lift panel, as you see here, support railings in the lifts. Um, we also put in anti skid beading, which you see at the end of these stairs. We also put up support railings uh, in various places for people to be able to access the space. Uh, apart from the uh, within infrastructure, but away from the building infrastructure, we also needed to put in certain spaces like calming zones and sensory zones, especially when working with neurodivergent uh, communities where these kids could be brought in to orient themselves or to calm them down if they start feeling overwhelmed or get agitated by something which, uh, which can happen. Uh, we also use communication tools, which you see on the right. They're called PEX cards or picture exchange communication system cards that are commonly used by some caregivers and families of children who normally are not able to communicate uh, because they can't verbally communicate or find it difficult to communicate in new environments. Uh, another important aspect of the implementation for phase was also training, and we take training very, very seriously uh, at IME, and we continue to do trainings with our staff, our entire facilities teams. Uh, this workshop that you're looking at here is specifically for the facilitators and for the volunteers who are going to work with uh, the neurodivergent community so that they know how to communicate and how to manage different types of situations and also their families and caregivers that come with them. Uh, looking at the second aspect of the program with the immersive tour development, also we looked at a research phase, an implementation phase and an impact measurement phase. The research methodology, I won't get into too much detail with this. I'm happy to share this uh, information separately with all of you. And we're also going to hopefully release a, a, a longer paper on this very soon. But the research methodology looked at primary sources and secondary sources. In uh, uh, secondary sources, we looked at uh, existing case studies, research materials, articles that had been uh, written around the subject by different organizations and different museums. We also did a lot of uh, online, on-site, and in-person data collection with, um, with beneficiaries and also their caregivers and families. Uh, based on that research, we developed six design parameters for the tour. These included preparedness to meet the needs of uh, neurodivergent children, environmental predictability, because they don't like uh, surprises, they don't like things, uh, you know, that are not, um, especially with the museum, because we have a lot of lights, we have projections, there's sound, so the tour needs to be planned uh, absolutely and completely uh, before we invite uh, certain groups in. Uh, this is also to avoid any unforeseen issues, which is why we put a definitive structure to the tour in place and know exactly how the tour will be conducted. This is a detailed survey. This is an online survey, actually, that we, it's a pre-visit form that we ask the caregivers to fill before they come. And this is sent to us 
ideally weeks in advance. So we know exactly which is the uh, individual beneficiary who's coming, what are their specific requirements and needs um, so that we can prepare and know exactly how to deal with each individual beneficiary so that the experience is a good experience. This is a tour map that was developed after uh, the research on the uh, immersive uh, part of the tour. Uh, this is the green line that you see is the route they would take. Pause points are marked. Uh, there's also collection points, transition points. So uh, a lot of detailed planning and study went into the uh, immersive tour program as well. The third aspect of the project was engagement uh, through the music therapy workshop. And here, uh, again, like I said, we work with different organizations and different specialists uh, because it's, it's very difficult for any institution to have in-house capability. And it's always important to collaborate and to partner with different institutions to be able to share knowledge and build. Uh, here, we worked with Swarakshima Foundation, which is based in Bangalore. The goal of these workshops, which is the music-based workshops, was to improve social skills, communication skills, and some amount of behavioral change. Uh, this aspect was also devised after a lot of research had been done. Uh, Saumya and Sanak of Surakshima Foundation already work on uh, various forms of music therapy, and they helped us uh, put this entire project uh, for the music workshops together. What you see here is a music uh, therapy kit that we use. Uh, with the children who come into the uh, to the workshops and it is given to the caretakers to take home, which they continue to use in their own spaces. The toolkit includes different instruments, music instruments, as well as an instruction manual and a pen drive with different playlists of prescribed music, uh, like meditative, calming music, daily recommended listening, positive reinforcement listening, and distractional music if, they're, if, they, uh, if they are in, uh, in a space of breakdown or they're uh, you know, caught in a particular emotion and they can't come out of it. So distractional music for that. The instruments that you see here are all tested. They're all uh, child-friendly, they are light, uh, they are in no way harmful. And the, this entire kit is given in a bag to the caregivers for them to take home. These are some images from the music therapy workshops. You'll see here that uh, the child is actually using a real didgeridoo, but in the toolkit, we give them a smaller, much lighter version of it, which they can then take home and continue doing the, uh, you know, the activities uh, in their own space. Uh, a snapshot of Project Swarita. Uh, in 21, 22, we uh, were able to serve 150 uh, beneficiaries and their caregivers. This year, we hope to serve about 300 beneficiaries. You may look at these numbers and think they're small, but uh, at IME, we believe in exclusivity for inclusion. The word exclusive needn't be confused as against inclusion. Inclusion advocates equal access and equal opportunity for all individuals. But in the case of people with disability, such experiences are limited due to being marginalized and deprived of diverse experiences for long periods of time. So exclusive access to a place like IME, we feel can serve as an equalizer. Our tours for the neurodivergent uh, community are conducted in very small groups of five at a time. And each uh, beneficiary child adult is accompanied by a parent or caregiver and a minimum of two to three IME facilitators and volunteers. This is another snapshot of some of the participants in the uh, Project Swarita workshops. We take written consent from the caregivers for uh, taking photographs and also for publishing. In many cases, we are told that they wouldn't like to be photographed and they definitely wouldn't like their uh, images to be published, which we are extremely respectful of. Uh, this project, like any other in an institution like ours, is not possible for us to do without the support of several individuals, organizations, and companies. Uh, this is just a snapshot of the different people and uh, organizations that were involved in Project Svarita. 
in 21, 22, and will continue to be will continue to be involved in 22, 23. Kota Karma uh, helps us financially and gives us the resources to conduct the program. And really, T and Swarakshima help us uh, design and conduct some of these workshops. And there are, of course, many many individuals who are part of this entire process, uh, which makes it which makes the entire project possible. In the realm of uh, online accessibility, because this also was an aspect that was brought, on during, brought up during the audit that was done with Access for All, uh, we looked at certain changes that we wanted to make to the website. But very recently, in fact, just in the last week or so, we have introduced a new plugin on our website. As you can see here, it's uh, the uh, company is called UserWay. It's just a plugin that you can uh, install on your website and it gives you this widget where you can uh, select a different type of uh, accessibility profile that you may need uh, and it is extremely user friendly uh, it creates a simpler and more accessible browsing experience for all users with different needs it's uh, available across different platforms including wordpress and uh, UserWay is actually currently the world's most advanced AI-based technology that ensures all visitors have uh, an accessible digital experience. It's uh, not very expensive and it is very easily installable on uh, most websites. It costs about $50 or 4,000 rupees uh, for a month. This is another view. Uh, this, so if you select a, a visually embed profile, then the color saturation on the images and the text increases uh, across the website. And you can also um, look at font, uh, the text starts uh, reading out. So it's a very, very useful, easy plugin. And it's so very useful for people with different abilities and we're so uh, we're very excited that we've been able to do this uh, we'll of course test it and uh, you know continue to get feedback from our partners and the community to see if uh, it is as usable as we would like it to be but this is a very easy way to make your work more accessible to different people Looking at some of the things that we want to do in the future with regard to accessibility development, uh, we want to share our research and findings. In fact, we have already started doing that. Uh, many of my colleagues have started uh, presenting their work at uh, domestic and international conferences. We also hope to publish uh, our paper and our research and uh, which we hope to do very soon. We are also developing an IME Museum app, uh, which we feel will make accessibility uh, more uh, accessible to a different uh, and a much larger audience. Periodic training and sensitization workshops outside of Project Swarita and outside of our programs is something that we have now started doing and we will continue to do. Uh, with our security staff, with our facilities teams, because more than anybody else, it is our security and facilities teams that actually encounter visitors on a day-to-day -day basis. And apart from the programs and projects, we also have a lot of people with different abilities walking into the museum. So it's very important that our staff and our teams are trained in how to manage and handle these uh, interactions. Uh, of course, continued infrastructure development based on the recommendations that Access for All has given. Uh, the other thing I would really like uh, for us to do is also do a review of the audit, if not annually, then biannually to see, uh, you know, where we started, where we are at, and also what are the current best practices uh, for museum and public institutions such as ourselves. And with that, I come to the end of my presentation. I want to thank you all for your time. And uh, I hope you've got a glimpse into how institutions and uh, museums are working on uh, accessibility, increasing accessibility for all. Thank you again for your time. And if you haven't come to IME, please do come visit and experience this space for yourself. Thank you. Prima and Siddhant. Thank you so much. It's, a, it's been uh, really an eye opener to all of us as to how uh, uh, and how much more really has to be done. I think one thing which I was taking away from the entire talk was uh, how it is a work in progress. And uh, 
uh, you know, I, incremental, I think, was a wonderful word which one of you used uh, as we sort of move and make this, um, because it, again, civilization really is a creature of evolution. Uh, uh, Prima, but I had a couple of questions. I'm going to share a personal experience, which I always have, is I'm invited to a party. Mm -hmm. I go there and there's this loud blazing music and I come back with a headache. Yeah. I can just imagine what it would do to someone with a neurodivergent problem. Yeah. So actually really two questions for you. One is, is there certain, uh, are there certain sort of musical things which people should avoid at parties if it was to be made an inclusive party? Mm -hmm. Are there certain sort of things which people should uh, either avoid or should we sort of make it um, sensitive that when you're inviting people, you have a disclaimer by saying there's going to be loud music. Like many people have this thing with allergies, peanut allergy, this, this is there, that is there. So should there be disclaimers or warnings, especially if you're inviting people with neurodivergent needs? What do you think about that? I mean, how, uh, is there certain music which we should be avoiding? Yeah, I would let uh, Siddhant answer the question about uh, private gatherings and parties. I can speak more from an organizational perspective, and especially when we are working with neurodivergent groups, what we, which is why the amount of research that we put into putting this entire program together, uh, which is why, like I said, there are certain areas in the museum where there is music. So a lot of it is through headphones, but there are some uh, areas where the music is projected or there's strobe lights or there's, uh, you know, lighting, uh, changing different colors. This can all be extremely disorienting, which is why that pre-visit form is very helpful to us to know which community, which kind of uh, different accessibility we are catering to. And also the tour map is such that, so with neurodivergent groups, there are only a few exhibits that we focus on. And uh, what even in the sound garden we encourage is that, uh, noise or loud sound doesn't really mean music. Uh, very beautiful sounds can be extremely quiet and very pleasurable as well. So uh, our uh, project and workshops are designed in such a way that uh, with neurodivergent groups, we take them only to certain exhibits, which is why we also have calming and sensory zones, where in case something like this happened, unforeseen circumstance, alarm has gone off, something has happened, we're all prepared that in that moment, the five kids who are there for the workshop or whichever uh, individual is having a breakdown is taken to this calming zone. With regard to personal uh, parties or events, Siddhan, would you like to chime in? Yeah, sure. No, I think, uh, Ganesh, that's a very valid question, you know, given one is like we have no clear understanding of the decibel level, you know, and what should be what is expected, you know, suddenly like you're grooving and the, the music just gets louder by as the evening proceeds, you know, and it also depends with the groups that are going in, you know, and that is when I, I come again, come back to the fact that you have to recognize that you people that you are inviting would have diverse needs. That is the first step into it. And as you see, like, you know, in uh, like it, you know, weddings and all, there are invites when they go out like we still don't do that but like abroad i've seen they would ask you for your dietary preferences they would ask you for your requirements it should be normalized that you ask for if somebody would have a challenge if there was strobe lighting that was going through or if there was loud music which was being played there should have been a disclaimer you know or even like if you have firecrackers for example like sudden like i've seen where wedding suddenly you have and a grand entry with firecrackers going and children getting scared or like even like senior citizens getting affected by that. So I think it is also about the sensitivity with which you kind of order the sequence of events. So I think, yes, definitely like having that disclaimer becomes an important thing. And we are current, we've been also working with the uh, Museum of Prime Ministers of India, the Pradhan Mantri Sangrale. And it is a complete digital experience. And one of the things that you would find in the spaces with digital engagement is that there is a disclaimer that there is constantly moving imagery or there are sounds, there are loud sounds that would come up immediately or like at any given point in time without any precedence. So you are kind of making them aware before they enter the space or they enter an event or a gathering. And then they make a conscious decision of whether they want to be there or not. 
See, that is precisely it because, uh, you know, there are many parties which you go to or these wedding receptions. It's like entering a, uh, a really a horror house. Suddenly something goes off and it becomes very unnerving and uh, things like that. So, yeah, uh, either they should, uh, uh, they should be a disclaimer or there should be a warning or there should also be a quiet zone where people can sort of recede to in the event they don't want to be part of this uh, bombardment, I think is the correct word, which... Uh, uh, really we should be using. I think that is one thing which we should all be taking home uh, as we make all our events um, more inclusive. Siddharth, actually a question for you. I was looking at that um, picture of a boy touching uh, the tactile next to Ravi Varma's Kadambari. Uh, and this is a question I've always wanted to ask you. How do they react when they first uh, you know, get to experience something new? I, I, what are their reactions? Very curious to know. See, the reactions are are diverse. They sometimes we've also got reactions where when they're touching it, it kind of it comes alive, right? And I can I can actually summarize that in uh, this was again coming from a feedback that I received from one of the persons who experienced the visual uh, element over there, and he just said that the fingers that could read today could see, and I think. That kind of just sums up the experience of what it is, right? You know, like I'm sorry, there's a party, literally a party going next door, and there is loud music, no consideration what's happening next door. And I'm right next to a hospital too, so <laughs> yeah, you're you're on mute, Ganesh. Ganesh, you're on mute. Look at the look at that extreme contrast where you have a hospital on one side. Yes. And you have loud sound on the other. I mean, that's really quite inconsiderate. I mean, uh, yes, you know, yes. things like that. It's it's just that, you know, people, I think, should be a little more sensitive as they go about inviting people or um, engaging in any social activity. That is something which, um, but what I find as we are sort of concluding, I think we're coming, short, uh, coming to the end of the session, um, is uh, one to reiterate that uh, this is not going to be the end of this conversation. This is this is an incremental process. This is a process where one, all of us, as Sidan says, we recognize it. We understand that you know there are so many people who are very different to uh, our abilities, and is really to cater to every one of them. And uh, as a civilization, uh, as we proceed on. It's a matter of becoming more and more sensitive uh, to inclusive living. So um, I wanted to thank both of you all for making the time this evening and uh, participating in this. Yes, Siddhan. Ganesh, you know, that you speak about, and I just wanted to reiterate on the fact that why we call this particular talk the, the art of inclusive living is because I think accessibility, inclusion, is something that is not only a need for a particular group of people. It could be for anyone at any given point in time, you know. If Siddhant, you went on mute. And this was just to tell you that at any given point in time, you could not be able to hear something if your infrastructure was not in place. So simulating that experience is just to give an idea that inclusive living has to be part of it. And as Ganesh rightly said, consideration, even like small elements of dignified living is a right of everyone. And it becomes duty of each and everyone in various services that we provide that we make it more inclusive and more accessible. So, yeah. Thank you. Any concluding comments, Prima, before we end the session? I think we've uh, talked about quite a bit here. The only thing I would like to uh, say is that, you know, a lot of organizations and institutions work with Access for All and other uh, organizations that work on accessibility. But the idea that this needs to be a continued engagement that is reviewed year on year on year is something I think that uh, we all need to be uh, more attentive of. And like Siddhant and you both said, inclusion, it's when something happens to us, uh, a debilitating injury or anything like that, that you realize how inaccessible some uh, places can be. So this is for all of us. Any concluding comments, Siddhant? Oh, I think as Prima said, right, that 
this is not one time thing like this can't be that one person does just one second sorry i had to be i had to take that tone to them and tell them stop <laughs> but yeah no i think this is something as prima rightly said that we've done this one year ago with them and we will again go there review the space so like likewise we also ask we also reach out to our older organization that we work with them because what happens is that when they see something changing something a new group of audience is coming in people get comfortable and now we have done something and it's also a social conscious tick mark that okay we've now done but i think it is also our job to constantly push for more inclusion and expand the bracket and make living more inclusive for all so yes so thank you so much ganesh for orchestrating the whole thing for us and so bringing us to this platform <laughs> thank you i have to thank both of you and the institutions which you represent access for all as also um the indian music experience uh, museum and i would also like to express my gratitude to the bangalore international center uh thank you for making this available to all of us thank you thank you thank you ganesh uh thank you prima and siddhant for this uh very important session i feel uh to you know bring more sensitivity to the masses and to make all our spaces more accessible in every way possible so thank you for your time today thank you so much for having us thank thank you thanks thanks